um, welcome to this uh, webinar by Gaia Asia Pacific. Uh, my name is Froyland Grate. I'm the Asia Pacific Coordinator of Gaia, um, and I'm based in Manila. Uh, Gaia is uh, Gaia AP is holding this Learn by the Nuggets, following demands from our members to join uh, global webinars, but at a time that is convenient for those who are uh, those of us who are based here in um, the Asia Pacific region. Learn by the Nuggets webinar series features work of our members discussions on new reports by Gaia and uh, our members as well, and general and in-depth discussion on Gaia Asia-Pacific campaigns and programs. Recording of the webinars and uh, web shops uh, are available at our uh, website, on our Facebook account, and YouTube channels. Um, people um, may continue to engage uh, in this post on our social media accounts. Um, today's session is called Unwrapping Plastic Food Packaging. Um, which is especially relevant in the context of uh, COVID as we are seeing increased use of single-use plastic packaging. And we're also seeing industry pushing the narrative that single-use plastic is safer. But is it really? Um, and our two speakers would be addressing this and uh, giving their insights on uh, these questions. Just a bit of background, in the early part of 2020, um, 33 world-renowned scientists um, issued a consensus statement warning that chemicals used in single-use plastics and food packaging represents a significant threat to human and planetary um, health, particularly the health of children. The consensus statement clearly states that approximately 12,000 chemicals are intentionally used in packaging and other forms of food contact materials. An enormous body of research, over 1,200 studies, shows that these chemicals migrate from packaging into food and beverages. And in response to this, more than 200 environmental and public health organizations, led by Break Free from Plastic members Upstream, Zero Waste, Europe, and Gaia, um, released a call to action, um, which include three calls. Uh, first is to ensure full disclosure and traceability of chemicals use in packaging throughout the supply chain. Second is to restrict the use of hazardous chemicals in food packaging. And third is to adopt policies that support the transition towards safe, reusable, and refillable packaging. Um, and our speakers will be expounding on these findings and these recommendations uh, later. For today's webinar, uh, this will last for about 90 minutes. First, we'll hear two presentations. And then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. We invite people in Zoom to use the Q&A section so that we're able to track your uh, questions. And for those who are following us on Facebook, you may type your questions or comments on uh, the live stream post on Facebook. Um, participants may continue to post your questions even after uh, the webinar, and we'll try our best to answer these questions. Um, those in uh, Zoom, um, you are on silence at this point. So if you have comments um, or questions, please use the Q&A function of uh, Zoom. If people have technical trouble, um, especially those who are on Zoom, uh, you may chat directly to Sonia and Trish from Agaya AP so that they may be able to uh, assist you address this uh, technical concerns. Now, I will go to our two presentations. First of our speaker is uh, Justin Neo. Uh, consumption and production campaigner for uh, Zero Waste Europe, as well as the policy coordinator for Rethink Plastic Alliance. Justin is a um, policy coordinator of the European NGO's coalition Rethink Plastic, part of the Break Free from Plastic movement. Before joining Zero Waste Europe, she has worked as EU Ocean and Fisheries Policy Advisor at Greenpeace for four years, and then as EU Affairs Officer at Surf Rider Foundation in Europe where she focused on the EU plastic strategy and the EU directive on single-use plastics. She has completed her legal training with a focus on international, European, and environmental laws. Um, Justin, you may start with your uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Roy. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, here it goes. 
and I think you should all be able to see it now. Um, yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Troy, for the introduction and for um, the invitation to, to the webinar. So um, what I would like to discuss a little bit is what we have done or what we're doing uh, as NGOs to try to ensure a safe food packaging across the globe. I'm not going to go too much into the science. We'll do that with the, the second speaker. Um, but I, I would like to give you a little bit uh, of context. Um, so food packaging is basically everywhere in our daily lives um, from, you know, food, uh, from yeah, food containers, beverage containers, coffee cups, all the fast food, all the sachets, even the wrapping of vegetables, etc. It's, it's really hard to, to avoid it. Um, and it's been harder and harder uh, in the last decades uh, due to the fact that we are mo like more and more into this uh, culture of disposable, of single-use plastic, of takeaway. Um, and so basically, yes, food packaging is all around us. Um, the thing is um, that um, food packaging is also a significant source of exposure to chemicals. Um, so as um, Freud mentioned, uh, there is about two, um, 12,000 chemicals used uh, in what we call food contact material, FCM, uh, but that's basically food packaging, but also other items that come in, in contact with uh, food, so that can be um, tableware, that can be uh, used in size to, to cook, etc. Um, and what's happening is that a lot of those chemicals that are used uh, in, in food packaging, they're not tested. So uh, we have actually very little information um, about the, the potential risk to, uh, to health. For others uh, chemicals, we actually have information and those uh, information show that they're actually really problematic. So if we um, look at chemicals such as bisphenol A that was used that is used a lot in, in bottles and, and in baby bottles until recently as well as cans but also phthalates etc. I think um, um, the, yeah, the second presentation will go more into the details of what those chemicals are and, and what type of risk they, they entail. Um, and basically those chemicals uh, can migrate from the packaging to the food and then be uh, ingested by, by us. Um, as I said, it's really hard to avoid these chemicals because they're everywhere and packaging is, is typically everywhere. Yet um, this, this exposure to chemicals and those chemicals are really strengthening the health and also future generation. A lot of those uh, problematic chemicals are what we call endocrine dis disrupting chemicals. So they have uh, really important in, in impacts on the hormonal systems, etc. And we also know that those chemicals have uh, a really strong and a possibly negative effects on the immune system as well. Um, and what we realize is that across the world, um, the, the regulations are, are completely inadequate to actually protect people from, from those chemicals. Um, and, and also importantly, uh, we realize that most people are actually unaware about uh, this issue and about how uh, important the exposure is through food packaging. So may, people may be aware of exposure to chemicals through pesticides, for example, or uh, through um, other source uh, of, of use of chemicals. But on, on this issue, we realize that there's very little awareness raising um, from people in general, but also largely from our decision makers. Um, and as uh, Freud mentioned, uh, we came together with uh, Gaia and, and with Upstream in the US to, um, to really start this, uh, this project that is called Unwrapped and that is part, yeah, this webinar is part two, to really uh, raise awareness on this issue of chemicals uh, and hazardous chemicals in food packaging and really call decision makers across the world to, to really strengthen the, the rules. Um, so as I said, there's really an urgent need to, to strengthen the rules and, and it doesn't come only from NGOs. Um, as Freud mentioned, in, in March, there was this uh, scientific consensus statement that was released um, with a clear um, signal and, and really ringing an alarm bell to the decision makers about the need to act uh, really quickly. And I, I won't say much more because Freud did. And also as a follow up to that, we, um, we as NGOs um, started this declaration of concern. Um, that was so, yeah, so far signed by more than 200 organizations is still open for, for signatures. 
And basically, um, you can find the link uh, on the presentation. I'll be happy to share after afterwards. But uh, basically, the the signatories to this declaration are really uh, calling on on main three issues. The first one is to ensure full disclosure and traceability of chemicals used, because one of the issue for uh, of the fact that people are just not aware is that there's usually no information and no obligation to fully disclosure. Um, what chemicals are used uh, in, in packaging. Um, the second element is really to restrict the use of hazardous chemicals in food packaging and prevent regrettable substitution. So clearly there sh some chemicals should just not be allowed in products and especially not in food packaging due to the, to the clear contacts. Um, and, and finally, uh, really calling lawmakers to support um, the transition towards safe and reusable packaging. So really, starting like from this, uh, from the context we are in at, at the moment, that is that uh, single use plastic packaging are both detrimental to our environment and that's quite well known, but also detrimental to, to our health. Um, so maybe on regrettable substitution, uh, just to explain a bit more, um, what we see um, in different regions of the world is that um, there's often a substitution of one as a chemical with another. So for example, uh, bisphenol A has been really largely um, uh, recognized as being really hazardous and we, it has been phased out of some products, uh, yet it has been replaced by other types of bisphenols. And now we, we're seeing that those bisphenols could have very, very much similar effects or possibly even worse effects. So there's really this idea of we need to, be, um, to have a precautionary approach and look at also sometimes families of uh, of chemicals rather than just re trying to replace one by another that may have exactly the, the similar effects, uh, but not just been restricted yet. Um, one of the things we, we've seen, um, at least in Europe, in the US, and, and I think possibly in Asia, it's also a similar issue is that um, due to the, to the action on plastic and due to the impact of single-use plastic on the environment, uh, there has been strong uh, action to really reduce single-use uh, plastic packaging yet we also had seen it replaced by a uh, single use uh, paper and it's it's not certainly not uh, the option that like the solution it remains single use and also in terms of um, chemicals in in the packaging it also raises a lot of questions because we know um, there's a lot of hazardous chemicals as well in in paper packaging such as uh, pfas that are called forever chemicals because they kind of never go away um, so really the solution should be in, in finding reusable and, and safe alternatives. Um, one thing I wanted to mention also and highlight a bit more is, is this issue of traceability um, because that, that is really lacking at the moment, uh, which means that even within the, the supply chain of plastic, um, they, they just don't know usually what there's really in the product. And as you move on into the supply chain, um, the person will just kind of trust the person that is coming be before in the value chain and not have necessarily all the information they require actually to really deal with the product properly. And that's especially a problem for recycling um, because there's very little information actually to waste recyclers, to waste collectors and recyclers on the chemicals that are uh, present in the food packaging. So that's a problem for their house as well uh, as workers in, in this, uh, in this uh, sector. But that's also a problem of possibly creating toxic recycling because then we're going to do a new product um, with, uh, with contaminated material and this new product could be a new food packaging but it could also go to, I don't know, a toy to a, to a kid, etc. Um, so it's, it's really an issue and as uh, we want to increase clean recycling as part of kind of making the circle uh, um, and cl closing the circle, it's really essential to phase out um, the hazardous chemicals from the start um, and to make sure that the recycling process um, are clean and, and, and through traceability of chemicals as well. Um, so what we're working on is, is trying to strengthen the rules at different level. Um, I will talk about the international level and the EU level because that's, that's what I know. Um, so at the international level, um, we, that's the breakthrough from plastic movement, uh, are advocating for um, the adoption of a global treaty on plastic that would include elements around chemicals and plastics. 
Um, so there has been discussion um, at the, the level of the United Nation for quite some years now on, on marine pollution and on plastic pollution in general. And um, since 2017, a group has started to look more into that uh, in the details and um, more and more discussion are happening on a possible treaty and more and more regions now uh, and countries are supporting the idea of having an international treaty on on plastics. Um, the next meeting of what we call UNEA, which is the UN uh, Environmental Assembly, will happen in February um, if everything um, goes according to plan. Um, and it could be that countries will decide to um, to clearly um, start a negotiation on on such a treaty. So that is something we, we're working on, engaging on, and, and very much supporting. Um, and in terms of what a, a treaty would look like and how it could be useful for this question of chemicals in plastic is that we feel that such a treaty, amongst uh, other things, could really require disclosure around the chemicals and the additives that are used in plastic production. It could also support setting uh, global criteria and standards, kind of minimum standards for product design, uh, for what type of additives can be added or not in a product, and also when it comes to labeling. Um, so that you can also provide the information to the consumers. Um, obviously, this treaty would need to be um, complementary and consistent with the existing conventions on, on chemicals. Um, so that's mainly the Stockholm Convention and what is called the UN Strategic Approach for Inter Integrated Chemicals Management. Um, that is a non-binding instrument, but that's framing very much the work of, of UN on, on chemicals. Um, and finally, this treaty, could really also help provide um, technical um, and financial support. So that, that could be really much about uh, exchanging best practices uh, between countries across the world, et cetera, and as well as financial support for, for some regions as well. Um, so that's one thing that is happening at the moment uh, and will continue to happen in, in the next few years and, and on, on which we are very much uh, engaged. Um, another thing that we do at Zero Waste Europe, because uh, we're based in uh, Brussels and working in Europe is also aiming at strengthening the rules at the European Union level. Um, basically, the current system, there's, there's a current regulation um, for the whole um, EU, but it's, it's still very limited. And um, the situation we are in at the moment is that the level of harmonization across countries in the European Union is actually quite low, which means that from one country to the next in the European Union, the level of protection is very different. And um, we are also in a situation where as other chemicals that are sometimes restricted in other legislation on chemicals in Europe are still allowed in food packaging. And that's clearly a nonsense. Um, and um, there's, there's in general um, a lack of traceability of chemicals in general uh, in, in, in packaging and products. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's really uh, hindering um, ensuring clean recycling processes. So, um, we have been working on, on pushing to have um, a revision of this legislation and there's an opportunity at the moment um, with the European Green Deal, which is this big initiative that was launched by the EU um, at the end of last year. And that includes uh, a number of uh, different strategies and different pieces of le legislation that will be adopted. And one of them is that uh, they will revise this EU legislation. So that's also something we're gonna work on um, in the next three, four years, uh, adopting new EU legislation takes time. Um, and we also see the, the opportunity here to, to set also some standards for the European Union that could possibly be replicated um, in other countries and also possibly be used uh, for the international then uh, global treaty as, as kind of a, a standards, uh, etc. So, and, and we really want to make sure that you know, all the, the EU and all the development on single-use plastic and the positive, you know, uh, legislation on reducing single-use plastics, et cetera, is also accompanied with all this uh, legislation on ensuring um, the safety of, of food packaging. Uh, one last thing, well, we do, or I would say in parallel to really like more advocacy work, I would say we're looking into exploring solutions um, and, and looking at what could be working best and what uh, solutions could look like. 
um, very much in Europe, but some of them can, can work across the, the globe. And what we're really supporting is actually using reusable systems rather than single use and using um, rather toxic free uh, materials. So that means uh, materials that are, you know, that do not contain any hazardous chemicals. Um, so one typical system is deposit return scheme where basically it's a reusable container that can be uh, reused and that can go back to the producer also to be washed to ensure the sanitization of the product, etc. cetera. Um, because the one last point I would like to make um, is that not all food packaging are equal um, on, on, in terms of safety. Um, so there's many uh, factors involved, uh, but depending from the material, obviously um, it will be different and the, the chemicals used will be different and the level of migration from from one material uh, to the food uh, compared to another material is quite different. So that's um, often we, we talk about um, materials that are more inert or more stable. So typically um, glass, ceramic and stainless steel uh, are considered more inert, which means that there's less likely going to be migration uh, to the foods. Um, while um, packaging uh, or materials like plastic and paper, um, they're, they're kind of really, um, I don't know how to use, which, to use to, which term to use, but there's high level of migration uh, because they're not that stable at all. Um, and obviously we also live in a world where the packaging can be very, very uh, complex in the sense that it's often very uh, uh, several layers, et cetera. And to that you add the coating, the, um, the inks uh, for uh, the packaging, etc. And all of those are really source of chemicals and they can also migrate through different layers depending on what those layers are and really add a mix of, of chemicals that is quite dangerous. Um, and obviously it really depends also on the condition of use. So it could be that uh, in some condition of use, a packaging will be uh, all right, but then if it's uh, microwave or if it's heated in any way, uh, it can increase the release of, of chemicals. Um, so it's indeed very technical, uh, but what is clear is that some materials um, are more inert than others. And actually those materials, which are glass, stainless steel, ceramic, etc., are usually used more for reusable solutions than for, for single use. Um, so that's also something to think, to think of, but also we also need to make sure that all those reusable uh, materials are also uh, completely safe from a health perspective. Um, so I will just uh, finish to, to say that really basically what we're looking at in terms of priorities to ensure safe food uh, packaging is really the adoption of uh, legislation that would phase out uh, hazardous chemical. Um, those legislation, depending on, on the region, can be at the national level, at the regional level, sometimes even more at the local level. Um, working to set those global minimum standards at the international level and and to and also working with local authorities with consumers etc to really support initiatives and solutions um, for reusable and safe uh, food packaging um, and i think i will leave it here thank you uh, thank you so much uh justin um just our reminders for everyone if you have questions for uh, Justin, uh, feel free to type your questions. Uh, if you're on Zoom, use the Q&A uh, function on Zoom. And if you're on Facebook, uh, type your question as comments on the FB Live post that we have on our uh, Gaia FB account. Um, and we'll try to answer all of these questions after our second uh, speaker. Now, our second speaker is Dr. Romy Tijano. He is from the University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital, and is also an advisor to the Pesticide Action Network. Um, a bit of information for Dr. Tijano, he is a doctor of medicine and has postgraduate and other trainings in pharmacology, medicine and uh, society, regulatory, basic and clinical toxicology and GMOs. He did research um, and uh, has completed studies on various drugs, drug utilization, medicinal plants and pesticides, and is doing ongoing studies on medicinal plants and uh, pesticides. He has instructional materials, manuals, book, and contributions and articles on toxicology, pharmacology, pesticides, toxic chemicals, uh, precautionary principle, medicinal plants, GMOs, uh, medicine and society, health and environment, and health and climate change. 
and is one of the um, recognized voices, recognized voices on, on this field. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Romy Tejano, for joining us and for sharing with us your uh, knowledge of this afternoon. Um, you may start with your presentation. Uh, who's controlling the uh, slides? I just uh, give an indication when to change the slide. All right, sir. Okay, can we uh, put on the slides, please? Yeah, well, anyway, greetings to everyone. I'm happy to be here with everybody. And uh, I'm given 20 minutes, so I'll try to finish within that time. Next slide, please. So I'd like to uh, approach the issue uh, rather comprehensively and from a holistic perspective. So I think it's important that we have a good understanding of what health is and what illness is. And as you can see here, um, I have modified the uh, WHO definition of health by including the uh, dimension or element of the spirituality and uh, harmony with the environment. So we have here the definition of good health as not only the absence of disease, but the state of complete physical, mental, spiritual, social well-being in harm and in harmony with the environment. So I think this is important in understanding the effects on health of toxic chemicals we find in food, food packaging. Next, please. So from this definition, we can uh, deduce certain generalizations or premises. I would like to emphasize on the uh, last two ones, uh, uh, which says good health is the state of harmony between the individual and the environment, and illness is the result of disruption of the harmony between the individual and the, and the environment. This is rather uh, divergent from the usual definition from the uh, medical mainstream. So perhaps uh, I need to illustrate further what I mean by this. Next, please. So I've come up with this diagram to show the different dimensions or different factors that affect our health in relation to the environment. So we have here the physical dimension, the biological dimension, the chemical dimension, the spiritual dimension, and underlying all of this would be the social dimension. Everything is interrelated and you cannot separate one dimension from the other. So when we, when we discuss toxic chemicals in food packaging, this would be under the dimension of chemical disruption of our harmony with the environment. However, we should always keep in mind that this is, this is only one in uh, several dimensions. That's why it's very difficult to really prove a certain individual chemical is having a, an adverse effect on health because this is inevitably connected with all the other dimensions that could affect the response of the individual, whether he would be ill or not. So it's extremely difficult to prove a cause and effect relationship between a with a single chemical and a certain illness. Uh, further discussion on this uh, would be found in my other paper, which I sent to the organizers. So those interested in going further into this uh, can just refer to this document. So I'll, give, I'll just proceed. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, there are many, uh, toxic chemicals actually that disrupt our harmony with the environment, among which would be the chemicals in food packaging, of course. And there are several ways of classifying these chemicals and the persistent organic pollutants is one of the significant categories. Uh, of course, we have the carcinogenic uh, substances and the uh, food packaging chemicals can also fall into this category. Embryotoxic agents and of course, endocrine disruptions. The next please. Now, of course, we relate this to food safety, and this has been mentioned already. I'd like to emphasize in this definition that food is unsafe if it contains an agent or contaminant, or if it is in a condition that could potentially cause an adverse effect uh, on human health. I'd like to emphasize the word here, potentially cause, because very often uh, when we engage in discussions regarding this, the authorities or industry would, would always say, but there's no proof that there is already an adverse effect on human health. So we should say that it doesn't have to have, it doesn't have, to have a, a scientific proof. It just says if there is a potential for adverse health effects, even if there's no conclusive evidence from scientific uh, 
studies that should be cost for uh, action already, which actually is the embodiment of the precautionary principle, which has already been mentioned. So I think this is important to uh, take into uh, consideration every time we go into discussions regarding toxic substances. Next, please. Well, almost all food actually uh, have potential toxic chemicals in them, including the packaging and even the table where they're put on. Next, please. So uh, just to be clear from a basic uh, uh, perspective uh, in understanding of what a poison is, if it is uh, producing a deleterious response or undesirable change in a living organism. So probably everybody knows that, that already. So I would not uh, elaborate on that. Next, please. Uh, this is just an illustration. Next, please. So uh, the different kinds of plastics which contain uh, toxic chemicals that would affect uh, health uh, have already been mentioned and I'll just go through them quite quickly. Uh, those that are labeled as number one would be the uh, polyethylene phthalate uh, group uh, with the uh, resin ID code number one. Next, just go pass through this because I'm sure you're familiar with this already. And then we have the number two, the high density uh, polyethylene uh, group. Next, please. Then you have the uh, PVCs with the number three as the coding number. Uh, one of the uh, probably most uh, toxic, uh, potentially toxic uh, packaging materials because of the uh, uh, toxic chemicals uh, contained in it, especially the vinyl chloride uh, residue that can be released. Uh, and also when uh, the uh, material is burned. Next, please. And then you have the low density uh, polyethylene. Uh, most of the wrappers belong to this number four uh, category. Next, please. And then you have the polypropylene. Uh, you're familiar with that, uh, especially those who are uh, uh, used to take yogurt and the like. Number five, uh, ID code. Next, please. Then you have the polystyrene. Uh, there's a lot of uh, disagreements about the toxicity of styrene, but again, if you use the precautionary principle, there should be no doubt that the, uh, this group of substances are also quite harmful to human health. Next, please. And then the number seven, which is where polycarbonate uh, uh, comes in. And this is where most of the bisphenols and the uh, similar toxic chemicals uh, are also released, uh, from, usually from this polycarbonate uh, packaging. So these are mostly the uh, most common types of uh, plastics that contain toxic chemicals uh, that could leach into the food itself. So I'll now go to uh, uh, more specifics. Next, please. So some of the toxic chemicals identified, of course, there are several, as has been mentioned, there could be thousands. Many of them have not been identified, but those that have been commonly identified with uh, uh, substantial uh, scientific information about them would be in this list. I haven't been able to, uh, to really go deeply into most of this, but the, I will just use some of this as illustrative examples. Uh, you're probably familiar with this already, but anyway, I'll go through them uh, one by one, except for a few, which I was not able to cover. Next, please. Of course, bisphenol A will probably the most uh, notorious of them all with a lot of uh, studies already, and in fact, it is the, the uh, it is bisphenol A that actually uh, stimulated uh, further interest in other endocrine disruptors. So there are several uh, adverse effects in human health that have been already been uh, elaborated, and I think there's uh, uh, it has come to a point what, that uh, there's no longer there's no longer reasonable doubt that this bisphenol A substance and the related substances are harmful to human health. So I've listed here the major uh, adverse health effects. Number one, of course, is endocrine disruption. And then very significantly, they also affect uh, immunity, immunologic dysfunction, and then cancer, of course, and neurodevelopmental disorders and neurobehavioral disorders, infertility and other reproductive effects, birth defects, asthma, allergy, uh, that could also be effect uh, as an extension of the immunologic effects. Homocyte obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and thyroid dysfunction. And there are 
probably others which I have not listed down here. I'd like to emphasize again the endocrine disruption effects and the immunologic dysfunction effects because if you have endocrine disrupting effect, even if you don't have scientific proof of, let's say, for example, diabetes or thyroid dysfunction, if you can show in uh, biological experiments that there is endocrine disrupting effect, you can actually logically deduce uh, other effects on the other organ systems because these are uh, encompassing uh, uh, system, or this is uh, what you might call a cross-cutting system in the, all the uh, systems in the human body. Uh, and that includes the immunologic system. Endocrine system and the immunologic system are intimately related. So if you have endocrine disrupting effect, you could expect uh, also some adverse effects on the immune system. You cannot separate these two. Therefore, if uh, the uh, scientific experiments only dealt with endocrine disruption uh, demonstration, even though there has been no specific immunologic studies, you can already conclude that there must be some immunologic dysfunction involved. The only thing is that it has not yet been discovered. So I think we should always keep that in mind. And we, see, we can see this repeatedly in most of these chemicals, probably all of these chemicals that are used in food packaging. Next, please. <coughs> so as you can see, with the phthalates, practically the same picture emerges, endocrine disruption, immunologic dysfunction, cancer, neurodevelopmental disorders, and by the way, this includes all autism spectrum disorders, which is now a very hot issue uh, in the, the United States. Not so much so, not so much I think in many other countries, but of course there are many other factors that contribute to the, these neurodevelopmental disorders, but uh, the uh, toxicants in food packaging uh, materials uh, would be one of those uh, significant uh, uh, causative factors. And then again, infertility and other reproductive effects, especially in males, phthalates, and this is one uh, factor that has been identified as very significant to explain the persistent reduction in male fertility over the decades. And then asthma allergy again, and then again obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and thyroid disorder. Next, please. So now we go to the PVC, and actually the, the monomer involved there is vinyl chloride, but, but there, is also, there are also phthalates, of course, and other uh, chemicals involved in the production of PVCs. So again, you can see the similar picture in terms of adverse health effects. Endocrine disruption again, immunolo immunologic dysfunction, cancer, etc., etc. The main difference perhaps would be if it is the vinyl chloride, then the the uh, seriousness is uh, is uh, large. I mean, greater. And uh, in terms of cancer uh, cancer uh, uh, production ability, vinyl chloride is uh, is uh, quite well known to uh, produce all sorts of cancer. And like, for example, phthalates, uh, there's still some controversy sometimes in terms of carcinogenic property, but for vinyl chloride, that is quite clear. Next, please. <laughs> then you have the brominated flame retardants that are also being used in, uh, in the production of all this, uh, this uh, food packaging materials. So again, you see the same picture, endocrine disruption, immunologic dysfunction, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, of course, we know that uh, some of these uh, brominated flame retardants like the PBDEs have already been included in the Stockholm Convention. Uh, and therefore, uh, internationally, at least officially, it has been recognized that these uh, are really significant uh, sources of adverse health effects and they need to be uh, eliminated uh, uh, globally. Uh, hopefully, other uh, persistent organic pollutants can also be included. Uh, still have a lot uh, to uh, look at. There's only a few included in the official list. Next, please. So next to the uh, brominated uh, flame retardants will be the alkyl phenols, and the uh, two most important examples will be nonyl phenol and the uh, octyl phenol. These are the group of chemicals also uh, together with bisphenol A were the first that were recognized as endocrine disruptors. Although again, uh, compared to other carcinogenic chemicals, uh, like for example, asbestos or uh, smoking, uh, 
alkylphenols as a causative uh, agent for cancer uh, has still has I think uh, still under uh, contest by the uh, industry. But nevertheless, uh, I think it's uh, beyond reasonable doubt that these compounds cause cancer. Perhaps the only difference is the probabilities. And then again, you see the similar uh, toxic effects. Although with alkyl phenols, there, are more, there is more scientific data on, on its toxic effect on lungs, uh, including cancer, and also toxic effects on liver and kidney. Uh, many of the studies would show definitive uh, toxic effects on liver and kidney as far as alkyl phenols is concerned. And then you see the usual uh, uh, adverse effects, obesity, diabetes, etc. Even if we go to the next chemical, uh, next please. We see the same picture again, the perfluorinated compounds. And this has been mentioned, I think, in the, in the conference uh, last time, emphasized that these perfluorinated compounds are significant sources of toxic chemicals found in food packaging materials. So you see again <coughs> the, uh, the same uh, toxicologic picture. And the scientific evidence for perfluorinated compounds will be as so strong as the dominated flame retardants. And many of these are actually uh, in similar uh, uh, classifications. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we can see here, uh, well, I haven't mentioned some. Next slide, please. I think I still have to mention something else. Yeah, antimony also, aside from, uh, there are also heavy metals involved in the, the production of uh, plastic wrapping uh, plastic wrapping materials for food, and one of them is antimony. Uh, and again, you can see endocrine disruption, immunologic dysfunction, cancer, and all the usual uh, adverse effects found in the other chemicals in food packaging. So antimony is also a significant concern when you look at toxic chemicals in food packaging materials, as well as the other uh, heavy metal, which is cadmium. Next, please. Cadmium, of course, is well known as a carcinogenic agent. In fact, it is considered class one carcinogen, among the highest uh, uh, categories in terms of uh, carcinogenic uh, possession. And this has been long known for several decades. And this is usually contained in the coloring materials in the packaging uh, 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 food uh, packaging uh, materials. Cadmium is uh, used uh, in, uh, as, as uh, I think, uh, also in printing. So you see here also endocrine disruption, immunologic dysfunction, and all the usual adverse effects listed uh, earlier. Next, please. So I think that's the last one. So uh, anyway, um, I just would like to emphasize that uh, most of these toxic chemicals have similar profiles, except that in terms of probability of causing adverse health effects, they have uh, somehow different differences in degree of uh, scientific information available, the uh, probabilities of causing cancer, probabilities in causing immunologic dysfunction and other uh, organ dysfunction, but basically they have similar profiles in in terms of causing adverse health effects. And uh, th th these uh, are based mainly on current uh, scientific information available. And again, I would like to emphasize that um, most of these chemicals have not been really studied toxicologically. Even, even if those, even of, uh, those that have been studied, actually they are of limited uh, extent because uh, uh, this is based on the uh, a, a very limited uh, uh, perspective. And, and when you look at the uh, overall holistic perspective, uh, a lot of these chemicals should be beyond reasonable doubt in terms of uh, concluding that it can cause adverse human health effects. I go, I'll go back to this holistic uh, diagram because I'd like to pick up uh, a very important uh, adverse effect uh, that you have commonly seen among these chemicals, and that is immunotoxicity. Uh, so I refer to this uh, holistic perspective again in discussing this. So next, please. So I would focus on the immune system because I think uh, this is one of the most important uh, uh, issue that uh, should be discussed in terms of uh, looking at the toxic chemicals involved in food packaging. <coughs> 
because when you talk about this immune uh, dysfunction of the immune system, you actually uh, you are only actually talking to practically all other systems in the body, and all practically all diseases can be linked to the dysfunction of the immune system, as well as the endocrine system. So these two overarching uh, systems, endocrine system and immune system, should be taken together. Although at this point, I'd like to emphasize on the immune system. And as you can see here, all the uh, dimensions I've mentioned earlier in terms of our relationship with the environment is inv are involved in uh, the dysfunction of the immune system. So I'd like to look at this uh, from uh, this holistic perspective. Next slide, please. And I've listed here uh, the threats to the immune system. And there's so many chemical threats actually. And uh, among them would be the endocrine disrupting chemicals, the plastics that we have mentioned, and the, uh, the uh, uh, brominated uh, flame retardants and, and many other chemicals. Uh, and as you can see here, very, even vaccines and pharmaceuticals would be a significant uh, factor in terms of uh, immune dysfunction. Next slide, please. And then uh, there's so many others, including uh, nanoparticles, as you can see here, other persistent toxic chemicals, food preservatives, industrial chemicals. Next, please. And that that only involves the chemical uh, aspects. Other uh, other threats to the immune system uh, uh, would also be very important, like for example, 5G or uh, electromagnetic radiation and that other types of radiation, which I will not be able to discuss. So suffice it to say that from a holistic perspective, there are many other factors to consider when you, when you talk about uh, toxicity to the immune system. And the toxic chemicals involved in food packaging is only one among these many systems. And that would again explain why it's so difficult to demonstrate from the current scientific methodologies the immunotoxic properties of these toxic chemicals There's, because there are so many confounding variables that cannot be isolated. So now I would like to go into the discussion on how we strengthen the immune system, because this is also one of the ways that we could, uh, 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 in the meantime, uh, do in terms of mitigating the effects of the toxic chemicals that we are confronted with. And uh, again, there are several factors involved, one of which would be maintaining a healthy microbiome. Uh, and I've listed several of the possible steps that you can do avoiding um, antibiotics and other uh, pharmaceuticals that affect the immune system, liberal intake of microbiome-friendly foods, fermented foods, et cetera, et cetera. So including uh, avoidance of uh, foods that might, might uh, affect the immune system. Next, please. I've also included uh, certain alter alternative uh, um, medicine procedures that uh, you can probably look into in terms of trying to strengthen your immune system to at least counteract some of the toxic effects of toxic chemicals and uh, other factors that would damage your immune system, including, of course, the COVID virus. You can also try to strengthen your immune system to, uh, to be better uh, able to uh, resist the COVID virus. Next, please. And there are general measures that I'd like to mention, precautionary, preventive, and protective measures, long-term and immediate also, especially uh, preventive measures during the developmental period of the immune system in the infants, mass awareness uh, in terms of uh, educating people, especially the mothers, and then confronting the social structural threats uh, to people's health and the immune system, of course, at the local, national, regional, and international levels. So I, in, this, in this connection, I'd like, again, to link this to the social uh, dimension I mentioned earlier, uh, that is a very significant uh, overarching factor in all these uh, issues that we are discussing, including the toxic chemicals in food packaging. And that is, we have to be in solidarity with people's movement to really have a genuine change in, uh, in uh, our social system, which actually produce the policies that would uh, uh, that create this toxic environment that we have. Next, please. Now, uh, going to the other possible mitigating uh, measures that we could uh, adopt uh, is using medicinal plants, or uh, many of these are actually part of our normal nutrition, especially in Asian countries. 
uh, many of these medicinal plants are known to have antioxidant and antitoxic properties, among which would uh, would emphasize the the uh, the plant moringa olifera uh, or moringa, which is well known in the Asia Pacific region. The seeds are actually a very good uh, have a very good antitoxic properties. So if you suspect that you have an intake of a toxic chemical, uh, you you can actually uh, uh, take in the powdered seed of the moringa to try to counteract it, which is uh, has a different mechanism compared to activated charcoal. You can use also activated charcoal. And um, the beauty with moringa is that you can use it also as food, and the fruit and the leaves. And both the fruit and the leaves have uh, antitoxic properties and have very good antioxidant uh, properties to counteract the molecular effects of toxic chemicals. And you can eat this practically every day, and as we do, in fact, most of, most of the time. Next, next, you can also use uh, uh, okra or ladies' fingers in English. Again, this is very popular in the Asia Pacific region. Also, I think in developed countries, there's a lot of okra available now. This also has good antitoxic properties, good antioxidant property also, and it's uh, have a, a, a broad spectrum. Uh, beneficial uh, effect on the, on human health. Next, Cofanus sativus or uh, radis is also good. I'll just go through these plants quickly, then you can just go to the uh, uh, details later on, perhaps you can research on them uh, on, on your own on the internet. Next, please. Let's just go through this quickly. This is a medicinal plant. That's a very good antiviral property also, aside from anti-cancer property. Next, please. And Vitex Negundo, Mirgundi in uh, India, I think that's called. And this is Lagundi in Philippines. I don't think it, this is this plant is present in developed countries. Next, please. Cannabis is also a very good medicinal plant. It has also some antitoxic properties. It can counteract some of the toxic properties of these chemicals. Next, please. And uh, one uh, very popular uh, medicinal plant is, of course, turmeric. And there's a lot of scientific evidence showing its medicinal benefits, including uh, anti-cancer and anti-toxic properties. Next, please. Some aromatic herbs like Melissa officinalis, uh, as the local English name for this again, I, for, I forgot. Uh, Next, please. And then the mint, uh, mint uh, group of aromatic plants. Next, please. Then uh, Thymus bulgaris. Yeah, next, please. You go through these uh, plants quickly. Hibiscus abdarifa, next. Yes, go through this quickly. And then the mulberry and spongia spinata. So these are some of the plants that uh, you can uh, uh, used to try to mitigate the uh, effects of these toxic chemicals. Now I'd like to go a little bit on the uh, social dimension to answer the question, why are we in this poison situation? So I've listed down here, a triumph of money over health, arrogance of power, ignorance, misuse of science. Unfortunately, most so-called experts have been uh, co-opted by the uh, uh, corporate uh, culture already and uh, there's lack of community participation and decision making at the community level. Next, please. Next. And uh, personally, I've experienced uh, the realities that toxic chemicals actually uh, uh, are controlled by, uh, by those in power. Scientific advisory committee, for example, was removed. Uh, and toxicology community, the same thing. I was member of this, uh, both of these committees in the Philippines before, and I was the first one to be removed when we recommended the banning of certain of these toxic chemicals. And I've been subject to harassment also. I've been sued by big corporations because of our advocacy on pesticides. And of course, as a scientist and involved in uh, research, I also know that there is a lot of corporate fund funding in scientific researches in academic and government institutions. Uh, unfortunately, even state institutions are uh, subject to this corporate influence. Next, please. And most toxicologists are in the employ of TNCs. And most scientific journals are controlled or influenced by big corporations. 
And even United Nations bodies, World Health Organization, for example, uh, is now highly dependent on uh, funding by private uh, foundations like the Bill Gates Foundation now is the, probably the highest uh, private donor to the WHO and they, they, uh, they have very big influence on the policies that are being put out by WHO. Next, please. So in general, I would say that the science policies, production, distribution, use and disposal of toxic chemicals are influenced by political, economic and cultural factors. Power relations, not the free market, largely determine the toxic chemicals agenda and the science and policies and portions serve mainly the privileged class, the rich and the powerful. So given these realities, I think we should also uh, take into consideration certain strategies to confront these structural uh, problems. Next, please. Next, please. So the social elements are also part of the threats to the immune system. I included them, next please. Corporate control, I, just, I would emphasize the corporate control. Global superpower, next please. So I've listed down here certain recommendations. Uh, develop safer alternatives, elimination or at least reduction of these hazardous chemicals. I'd like to emphasize the precautionary principle and the holistic approach in addressing problems. We need to spend more time actually uh, <coughs> communicating with uh, in the, the, the press communities because many of them would have uh, more basic uh, issues rather than uh, toxic chemicals. For example, land problem, basic of survival is main issue. And therefore, we need to relate our particular issue of toxic chemicals to their basic problem of land and, uh, and uh, human rights violation, for example. Next, please. So I think you're familiar with many of these recommendations. So I'd like to emphasize the shifting uh, to agroecological production system and having environment-friendly, sustainable industrial product production system. And of course, so this is part of the neoliberal uh, structural order that we are in now. Next, please. I think uh, to stop these toxic chemicals, we have to do much more in terms of the social dimension rather than the technical dimension, because we always will be on the losing end if we limit ourselves to the science uh, technical issues, for example, as we have experienced in many of these scientific uh, conferences and also in international meetings uh, pertaining to the technical issues of toxic chemicals. We need to strengthen people, I would say, we need to strengthen more the people's movement to really achieve uh, significant change. Next, please. Precautionary principle, you know that, I emphasize that. Next, please. And this is a summary of, uh, of what needs to be done, I think, in terms of strategic, uh, uh, the strategic actions, uh, awareness raising, you're also familiar with that, networking, technical capacity building. Let's, let's have our own experts in our NGOs. You know, we should not be uh, too dependent on experts. Information exchange, and we should deepen our understanding, especially on the structural roots of this problem. And organizing concerned people, especially at the grassroots level. Basically, the key, I think, is empowerment of people. If most of these environmental movements would come together and unite and pressure governments and industry to change, I think it would create a much more significant effects. Next, please. There are certain obstacles to overcome. Next, please. And we could start even small uh, discussion groups at the community level because most of the people are in the poor areas at the community level. And unless people are mobilized to really confront these basic issues and issues like toxic chemicals in food packaging, it's very difficult to really change the situation because those in power will always have the power to overcome uh, whatever we put out in uh, technical discussions. They can always overwhelm our scientific studies with their of their own scientific studies. And therefore organizing is very important. And people 
people's movement is very important. We have to strengthen people's movement. That's why I always uh, go to these uh, marches myself. Next, please. And that would be the conclusion of my presentation. We need people power. Thank you so much for your listening. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Romy Kehana. I'd like to thank our two speakers again for sharing with us their knowledge this afternoon. Justin, thank you, and uh, Dr. Romy Kehano. Now we have uh, time for uh, questions. I'd like to encourage everyone, those who are on Zoom, to type your questions on the Q&A box of Zoom. And for those who are following us on Facebook, feel free to type your question on the comment section and we'll relay those questions to um, our speakers. So, um, I'll probably start with a few questions to allow people uh, the time to uh, give their question. Uh, Justin, um, the single-use plastic policy in Europe has been celebrated as one of the models or examples around, around the world. Um, can you tell us how much of those uh, public discussions that led towards uh, the SUP policy in Europe were influenced by um, health concerns versus uh, environmental concerns like um, marine plastic pollution, for example? Yes, sure. thanks, uh, Croy and Finn, for the question. Um, so clearly, um, the, the single-use plastic directive in, in Europe was mainly driven by uh, environmental uh, purpose. And what uh, Europe did is basically look at uh, the, the items we found the most commonly uh, on the environment, uh, and especially on beaches and the marine environment. So definitely, um, originally, it is mainly from environmental perspective. Yet it's interesting to see that actually the objective of the directive clearly said that it's about uh, reducing the impacts of certain plastic products or so certain single-use plastic products on the environment and on health. So the, the health impact is still there, even though it was mainly from, from an environmental perspective to start with. And also I remember that during the negotiations uh, within the European Parliament and with the countries, the element of health was discussed quite, quite a bit. And for example, it was decided that to, to add to the list of uh, proposed banned items, food containers and cups that are in um, ex extended polystyrene. And that was also like partly because they have a very strong impact on the environment to the fact that they degrade in very small uh, pieces, but also because they're known to have really a health risk uh, as well. And there was also a lot of discussion on possibly labeling uh, the presence of, of hazardous chemicals. So I would say the health impact was part of the discussion. It's definitely part of the objective, even though the basis was environmental protection. Thank you so much, um, Justin. Um, Dr. Romy, thank you for the presentation. It's quite refreshing to hear a doctor talk about uh, the issue of health and disease from a holistic perspective, you know. Uh, um, right now, I'm feeling a bit under the weather and um, initially I was thinking of heading to the pharmacy, but after hearing your presentation, maybe I should go to my local market and look for those plants that you've uh, mentioned. But my question uh, for you is, in the antidote that you've presented, one of the recommendations that you've mentioned is to grow the network. And I uh, would assume a lot of our uh, listeners or viewers on this uh, webinar are NGOs. Uh, would you have any advice uh, for the NGO participants in terms of how can we engage with the uh, health professionals and bring them in this issue of uh, toxics and health, especially as it relates to the issue of plastic? Well, it, it really depends on the culture and situation in their own countries and perhaps in their own professional uh, <coughs> fields. There's a lot of variabilities. It's very difficult to engage medical doctors, for example, in this kind of uh, discussions. Uh, but you can appeal to the humanitarian uh, aspect. Uh, in, in our case, uh, one of our organizing uh, methods is just to invite them to some medical missions where they are exposed to uh, more uh, basic issues uh, from the communities. And then uh, they can listen to the issues being, being uh, shared by, uh, by the people there. And hopefully, uh, some of them would uh, would be interested in uh, further uh, involvement and be open to further invitation. So that's how we started our organizing in the health sector here in the Philippines. Although I would say that it's extremely difficult to get 
uh, many doctors in 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 this kind of involvement. Other professionals, I'm not too sure, but I think the same is true. You start uh, through uh, by uh, engaging in their own field of expertise, and uh, you don't have to be an expert yourself, but uh, uh, trying to uh, to uh, engage them uh, in the field that they are familiar with in the beginning, and then you try to expand later on this kind of interest. And of course, if you have an NGO already that is well known, then probably uh, inviting them as a resource speaker, uh, as a resource person, even though they don't agree with many of your advocacies, if they can uh, give certain uh, advice that can be useful to you in terms of their technical expertise, that could be start. Uh, it's easier to um, do organizing at the country level because people can really feel, uh, based on their own experiences, uh, the difficulties in terms of, uh, of experiences that they do not quite understand, for example, with toxic chemicals. That's what we uh, learned in our advocacy for pesticide uh, when we went to the communities. Uh, they, of course, knew that they were being poisoned, but they're not quite sure if it's really the chemicals. So when we came in there, they, they became sure that it was the chemicals. And that started their own organizing in terms of campaigning against uh, pesticides themselves. So I think in other fields you can do similarly, but of course I'm not sure because I don't know exactly the other fields, uh, how they do their own work. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Promi. Uh, we have one question from Zoom. Um, and Justin it may, and, and Dr. Romy, I'll feel free to answer this. Uh, we have a question from Indonesia. Um, we know that uh, there has been a lot of development on biodegradable plastic. Is this step, step significant in terms of helping the issue of uh, plastic waste? Uh, the PC is increasing in the context of uh, COVID. Uh, Justin, what's the position of the groups in, in your group on uh, bioplastics? Thank you. Um, yeah, indeed, bioplastic is a big question. So in, uh, on, often under the word bioplastic, there's two things. There's uh, plastic that are biosourced or biobased, so they come from another source than oil um, or partly from another source and those plastic they tend to be they can behave exactly the same as uh, conventional plastic and bio-based plastic doesn't mean biodegradable and then when it comes to biodegradable uh, plastic it's often very challenging um, because biodegradable can mean many things and I, I obviously speak mainly from experience in Europe but, um, because it, what we have in Europe is a framework where biodegradable usually means either um, compostable in a specific facility uh, because it would require high temperature, etc. So actually, uh, they're not biodegradable in the environment. They're compostable in a specific environment conditions. And so that would require a separate collection of those compostable items and then going to the, to the right um, facility. And what we see mainly is that most of those compostables uh, in Europe, they actually end up in the normal bin and in, in incineration and then feeding just because the infrastructure is not there as well. And then there's um, home compostability that is developing as well a lot. Uh, but what we see with home compostability is that it can take like sometimes up to a year for, you know, plastic bags or something to actually really uh, compost in a home compost. So all the trials are not very positive, I would say. And then you have to be able to manage your compost very well. And some people know how to do that others may find it more challenging. And there's a question of balance in your compost as well. There's a lot of discussion around soil biodegradability as well. They're looking into, could we have agriculture mulches that are biodegradable so that we don't have microplastics in the soil, et cetera. But this is very early stage. And at the moment, the, the results are really not really conclusive. And then when it comes to biodegradability in the environment in general or in the marine environment, it's, it's really, it's really uh, complicated also because they're trying to design elements that are or products that are um, by, that degradable in a certain environment and it usually takes a lot of time and also if it happens that it ends up in another environment then it may not biodegrade so it's it's very challenging and i would say um in general this is not a solution um there may be very few application where it's interesting to look at but for single-use plastic the solution is not there the solution is by moving away from single use and just replacing with reusable alternatives or no packaging where there's no need of packaging or um, packaging that is made in another material or natural uh, material that can be reused 
Um, so yeah, that remains that. Uh, thank you, Justin. Um, for the others, we'll see. We still have time for your questions. Uh, Dr. Romy, a uh, question uh, here. Um, hearing you, I think I'm reminded of this phrase that um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, which is especially true in the context of uh, the, the toxic chemicals in um, our food and the uh, food contact materials, right? Um, and I'm bothered by uh, what uh, both of you mentioned that um, there are 12,000 uh, chemicals that are either intentionally added in, in these food contact materials, and yet most of these are um, not identified at this point. Um, what is the view of the medical um, field on this uh, in terms of the chemicals that uh, you've mentioned? Um, uh, we're not sure whether they, they, they uh, have a negative impact on our health. So why is there not enough studies to uh, identify these chemicals? From your perspective, what, why is that? Well, most medical doctors are, are not even aware of these issues we're talking about much more for the toxic chemicals that are there. Uh, therefore, uh, they, they are uh, foreign to this kind of issue. Uh, and therefore, uh, the interest is also not there. And even the scientists uh, involved in, uh, in uh, studying toxic chemicals, they are highly dependent on corporate funding at this point. Uh, there's hardly any uh, independent public fund that is being given to uh, independent scientists to do this. Unlike when I was a student several decades back, at least uh, there are about 60 to 80 percent uh, public funding for independent research. Now, practically all funding is dependent on corporate funding. And therefore, you could expect that most of the scientific results will be favorable to them. And there's hardly any interest in uh, trying to find out what are these toxic chemicals uh, that are being uh, put out in our food packaging materials? And not only that, in, in, uh, in practically all fields, pesticides, for example, or even industrial chemicals. And uh, we know, for example, that there are hundreds of thousands of these chemicals that are out there in the environment. And probably 12,000 is a very conservative estimate. Uh, and therefore, uh, that is why I, I find it uh, uh, rather uh, not not cost effective in uh, spending a lot of effort trying to ban a certain chemical when in fact uh, in terms of the overall picture that hardly makes any difference and that's why i emphasize the structural causes of this uh, poison situation because unless we uh, we really uh, change the power relations in the world we cannot really advance uh, significantly that's why I always emphasize this is structural causes of these problems. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Romy. And maybe for the NGOs who are um, attending this webinar, that is maybe the challenge for us. You know, as uh, Dr. Romy mentioned, um, most of these uh, doctors are not even aware of this. And maybe our work as NGOs is to ensure that this information is being um, uh, said out, out loud. So that's one. Justin, uh, in your experience with the uh, uh, campaign for the uh, single-use plastic policy in Europe, was the medical and the health sector involved as much? Um, how did you engage with them? Um, so on, on this file, to be honest, they were not very much uh, involved, I think, uh, because um, indeed the, the single-use uh, plastic directive was very much seen as a as a tool to protect the environment more than health, even though it's, it's included in. Um, but we also see uh, on the issue of food, pa food packaging and chemicals in food packaging, they are definitely more involved. Um, and in Europe, we also work within NGOs and trying to bring NGOs because the interesting element with food packaging and what we call food contact material in general mm -hmm. is that it's, it's a little bit at the crossroad of many topics. It's about chemicals, it's about consumers, right? It's about food, and it's also about circular economy and reducing packaging in general. Um, and so we're working with other NGOs that are um, closer to the health sector, as we said. So one is uh, HEAL, which is uh, Health and Environment. Um, and they're, they're also an, a big European uh, organization and have closer links and they, they, they are used to, to work more with, with the medical sector. But I would say this is also a topic where we work much more with uh, scientists as well. And, and we see um, there's more links um, and it's, and it's also for us as NGOs to really build on, on the 
the concerns raised by the, the scientific community and, and to really bring that as well to, to the public, but to the, com to the decision makers as well. Uh, thank you, Justin. I think um, unless there are other questions from the uh, participants, uh, I'll, I'll be inviting you to uh, prepare your closing remarks and maybe invite you to relate really the issue of um, plastic with uh, what we're seeing right now with COVID, if you have um, any thoughts on that. But prior to your closing remarks, Dr. Romy, you've mentioned one of your recommendations or one of the findings was that um, there was uh, also a report that uh, people who consume fermented food um, has certain advantages in terms of how their body responded to uh, COVID. Um, and incidentally, that was also mentioned in your um, recommendation where fermented food has a role in, in promoting health. Can you just expound on that a bit before we have our closing remarks? Well, this is in relation to the uh, uh, relatively new scientific information that the microbiome or the beneficial microorganisms are actually very critical in terms of, of uh, the development and strengthening and maintenance of our immune system. And uh, any assault uh, to the integrity of our beneficial microorganisms in our body, which actually outnumber the number of cells of our bodies, would weaken our immune system. And, uh, it, and the fermented foods are full of uh, at least the legitimate ones, not, <laughs> not all fermented foods, of course, uh, acceptable. But uh, the usual uh, uh, traditional fermented foods uh, are uh, high in the content of beneficial microorganisms. And of course, the very familiar one you know is lactobacillus, of course, but there are many others that uh, we uh, don't know which are present actually in the fermented foods. So, uh, <clears throat> so you have in Indonesia, for example, tempeh. In Japan, you have your natto. In Korea, you have your kimchi. In the Philippines, we have a lot of, uh, of, of, of uh, burro or something. And the, uh, you have uh, in Europe, I think, the uh, sauerkraut or something like that. So these have been found to be uh, uh, quite uh, useful in terms of strengthening our immune system. So this is, of course, just one among the many, uh, many measures I've mentioned uh, that could strengthen your immune system. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Romy. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. And I know Putini and Budaro from Indonesia are, are listening on Facebook. I think uh, I just found another excuse to indulge in tempeh next time I uh, visit Indonesia. Um, but in, in relation to uh, plastic, I think um, one of the common narrative that we're hearing from the industry is that plastic is necessary to uh, preserve food, right? To prolong the life of food. And yet we're, we're hearing from you that uh, fermentation could be one of uh, ways to prolong our uh, vegetables, for example, uh, with kimchi, for example, and also um, has an extra benefit in terms of um, uh, boosting our health. So I think that's an interesting information. So now I'd like to invite uh, both of you for your closing uh, remarks. Uh, I'll start with uh, Justin. Um, thanks, Roy. And, and maybe just to build on that, and because you mentioned COVID, um, I think, I mean, it's been uh, interesting to say the least uh, to see the industry trying to use the, the pandemic uh, to really sell more single-use plastic um, and also using um, the understandable fear uh, of the pandemic and the fact that we knew quite a bit of little at, at the beginning on the transmission. Uh, but I think on this, since now like we have more information, it's been clear that um, the main transmission is through uh, air, et cetera, and it's not through contacts uh, and through surfaces. And also it is very clear, and it was always very clear that there was no reason uh, for stronger contamination through a reusable container than through a single use plastic that may have traveled uh, three times across the world before you, it, it reaches you. Um, and, and more than this, it's actually that the chemicals uh, that are contained in single-use food packaging at the moment are responsible, among many other things, uh, in, in uh, affecting our immune system and, and so kind of making us more at risk at an individual level, but also at the collective level. Um, so it, it, is, um, it is interesting and this pandemic also shows us how we need uh, to bring resilience in general in our society and, and focus more on sustainable and relocalized food system uh, 
uh, that phase out chemicals and packaging uh, overall, and that also reduce food waste because we were also talking about that. Um, and often when we talk about chemicals, it's hard to be really positive because it's a bit gloomy. As you say, like there's so many chemicals used everywhere. You, you're wondering how we're actually going to tackle that. But I also feel quite hopeful because the solutions do exist. And we also see more and more initiatives at the local level, at the community level, uh, on trying to find solutions that are both protecting our health and our environment. Um, so I would yeah, end on a positive note and saying that it's about us together uh, scaling up those solutions and bringing those solutions also to decision makers to really show that they can be ambitious, they can adopt strong legislation because solutions are there and people are ready for, for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, Dr. Rami, uh, closing remarks? Yes, I would like to emphasize, yeah, I would like to emphasize again the use of precautionary principle. And people should realize that uh, science now is practically uh, under the control of corporations. Uh, this is corporate science, not real people science. So we should reclaim the real science, and we should not wait for the uh, methods used by corporate science that is being used by most official bodies, in, in, including international ones, like WHO and the others, uh, that they will not declare that a toxic chemical is a to human health unless they get some definitive results from scientific studies that are produced by the corporations themselves that are selling these toxic chemicals. So this is unacceptable. And they should, we should uh, emphasize uh, uh, independent science, unfortunately, which is very limited now. But again, uh, if there is no sufficient science to show the toxic uh, effects of certain toxic chemicals that are related to other toxic chemicals, we should assume that they are also toxic, even without the uh, definitive scientific information about it, especially if we have already some, uh, some uh, biological basis to say that, for example, we know already the mechanism of toxicity about this group of chemicals. For example, if you know that this belongs to the, the, uh, the group of, uh, of uh, brominated flame retardants, you don't need additional scientific studies to prove that they are toxic to humans. You just decide that they are. And uh, if they're not very useful, then they should not be allowed uh, to, uh, to be sold. So again, uh, the critical uh, issue here is that uh, uh, people are not empowered and uh, it is the power elite basically uh, driven by big corporations that actually determine the world agenda on chemicals and uh, pretty much uh, everything else and therefore we should uh, be in solidarity with the mass movement workers peasants and the others in terms of regaining the power of the people so that's that's probably would be my last remark Thank you so much, Dr. Rami. I think those are very relevant words, especially in, in uh, the environment that we're operating right now, where our voices as people are being um, constrained. So I think that is both a call to action for us and a challenge for uh, all of us. I'd like to thank again, uh, Justin and Dr. Rami, for your time and for your contribution in making this afternoon uh, very insightful. Thank you, uh, on behalf of the entire team of Gaia. Thank you so much. I also would like to thank all our viewers, those join on Zoom and on Facebook. Thank you for joining us. And um, of course, I also would like to shout out again to the two people behind the camera or behind the screen who made this afternoon possible, uh, Trish and, uh, and Sonia. And uh, thank you for, for um, all the support. And lastly, uh, we invite everyone to check Gaia Asia Pacific's Facebook account. Uh, Gaia Asia Pacific on uh, Instagram and Twitter. We are Zero Waste Asia for our um, other schedules of webinars. The next one is on July 29th, um, looking at the uh, European incineration meet. So if you're interested, you can find the details in our social media accounts. Uh, with that, thank you all and have a pleasant morning, afternoon, and evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you too. Bye.